Our scripture passage today is from the good news according to Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Before we read this, let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious and heavenly Father, as we open up your word and read, Lord, the wisdom and the guidance that you have within for us, we pray, Lord, that you would guide us. Father, direct us and teach us by your spirit. Lord, we can understand none of these things you have revealed to us without that revelation in our hearts. So, Father, I pray that you send us to it now. Open our hearts and minds that we may hear and we may understand. Bless, Lord, this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm going to read the scripture passage, and then there will be a brief moment of quiet meditation following. This is the good news according to Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Listen now to the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, but they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Human history is filled with the stories, even though they're true stories, of powerful people that want to defy death. Full of many examples of the the most powerful and some of the most famous among us that want to do what we are told no human being can do defy death, and live forever. We're told that the first emperor of China sent all of his subjects out across the world on a quest to find him a potion that would grant him immortality. And in a uh, strange and ironic twist of fate, one of those subjects brought him back a mixture that contained mercury. And the first emperor of China, trying to avoid death, ended up drinking a poison solution that led to his death. Now, you all probably remember in history learning about uh, Ponce de Leon, a great explorer that explored through Florida, and that his quest was to find this, uh, this mythic fountain called the Fountain of Youth that you could drink and stay young forever. And all throughout the Middle Ages, a group of men called the alchemists, who are the precursors for our modern-day chemists, were on a quest to mix up what they called the elixir of life, which is just like it sounds, something that you can drink, and by drinking of it, you get to live forever. Now, just in case you think that today, living in a scientific, rational, enlightened society, that we have abandoned such fanciful quest, you're wrong. The quest still continues, but it's, it's taken a bit of a scientific turn. Take these few examples Uh, of of groups that you can still find today operating um, in the name and under technology and science. There is the Methuselah Foundation, which wants to use science and technology to end death. And right now they have the more modest goal of by 2030, making 90 the new 50. There is also the SENS, SENS organization, not SENS, S-I, but SENS organization, And they look at old age as a disease. 
like the cold or the flu. And just like any of those, they believe that this disease is also curable. So no one ever has to die. There's also the more unusual 2045 initiative. And that was set up by a Russian tycoon by the name of, by the name of Dmitry Itzkov. And he has a little uh, different dream of achieving immortality. He wants to take human consciousness and upload it into computers. And then once our consciousness is in a computer, then we can put it in a robotic or a cybernetic body and thereby achieve a type of immortality. And there are a lot of powerful and actually popular men that have joined this crusade. Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal. Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google. All of them have donated money to one or multiple of these organizations looking to end the scourge of death. Even Jeff Bezos has gotten in on the action as well. And this movement has taken up so much momentum, they even have their own political party. It's true, you can look it up. They're called the Transhumanist Party. And when you look at their core values, according to their webpage, their first core value is the extension of human life through science and technology. This has always been the great dream of humanity. It's always been the great dream of almost every human life is that somehow, some way, we might achieve immortality. It goes back to our very earliest stories. Another story from school, you might remember the Epic of Gilgamesh. I don't know if any recall that one. Where our hero actually obtained this herb where if he ate it, he could achieve immortality, eternal life. But before he ate it, he put it down on the ground and, and stopped to sip some water. And a snake came and grabbed it instead, thereby robbing us of the gift. Our own Bible has the story early on in Genesis chapter 3. We are told Adam and Eve are evicted from the garden so they do not eat from the tree of life. Because if they had eaten from the tree of life, they would have lived forever. Also deceived like Gilgamesh by a snake. Ever since human beings have been on this earth, ever since human beings have been on this earth and aware of, their, of our own deaths, we have stared into this great abyss, this great darkness that lies beyond, and we've seen every single person we know, no matter how rich, no matter how powerful, no matter how great they are, have been swallowed up by this darkness. And we've looked into this abyss and we are afraid. Because we know one day, we too must take that fateful step. Now it all sounds kind of grim for, for an Easter Sunday, right? But we are going to talk about some good news. I'm talking about this bad news because it always sets up the good news. And we've been actually talking about good news all through the season of Lent. Because that's what our faith is after all. We call it the good news. And we call spreading our faith, spreading the good news. So we've taken a while to step back and ask, what exactly is this good news and what does it entail? Now, I know you'll all remember exactly what we've talked about so far, right? You all remembered all of it. Anybody tell me some good news? What's some of the good news? Anybody? He is risen. Well, that's to, yes, that's today. You're jumping the gun. That's not what we've talked about yet. That was kind of cheating. Anybody else? I won't put you on the spot. I'll tell you what well, this good news we've talked about so far. Our sins are forgiven. It's good news. The kingdom of God is established and we have been given citizenship in that kingdom. Evil has been overcome and conquered. Jesus is our friend. Jesus will heal all of our infirmities and all of our weaknesses. Power of faith in Jesus Christ can do all things. We have access to God the Father through Christ. And last week we talked about Jesus is coming back one day. All good news. All, all of this was, was only brought about by the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. You cannot separate the good news out from Jesus. Without Him, we have no good news. Without Christ, it is all bad news. And this good news he's brought us is very good indeed. There is, there is a little 
little fly in the ointment to this good news. At least the ones that I've mentioned so far. And that's that life does end one day. Jesus has made our life good. Jesus has made our life better than any human beings had before he came to this earth. But still we have this fact that life ends and that kind of spoils it all. And it doesn't matter how, how privileged or powerful you are. Death will end it for every single one of us. And in fact, the more powerful and privileged you are, the more it ends. The more that it spoils. Which is perhaps why the most powerful among us have always sought immortality with the most gusto. Because they have the most to lose. But no matter who you are, great or small, rich or poor, privileged or unprivileged, a party comes to an end. So it sounds like the news is no longer good. But as Richard reminded us today, there is a better bit of good news coming, which makes this particular piece of good news so good. Christ has risen. Jesus did the impossible. Jesus did what no one could do. Jesus did what no one should be able to do. He died like all living things die. Just like we will one day. But death, death could not hold him. Death couldn't hold on to him and, and it had to give him up. Imagine that we at life are at war. And we're at this, this constant battle and a war with this thing that we call mortality. This getting old and dying. We're at this, we're at this war and, and we battle and we fight old age as, as much as we can. And, and we have a few little victories. We have a few little victories here and there. We can, we can hold it off as, as much as possible. We, we live healthy lives. We live good lives. We take care of ourselves. We don't smoke. We wear a seatbelt. We get plenty of sleep. Wear sunscreen. All that good stuff. But as much as we fight and as violent, violently as we try to fight and these small battles that we might win, we still lose consistently. The line gets pushed back. We eventually lose the war. Mortality wins. We succumb. And death conquers. Except it didn't go that way with Jesus. Jesus. He engaged in the very same battle that we engage in, but his result was seeming was very, very different. See, at first it seemed like he lost. He died as you would expect someone to die who was, who was tortured and nailed to a cross and then left to die. He died and he was laid in the grave and it looked like death had won, just like death had won against every single other person who had gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with death. But here's where the story changes. Here is where the tide shifts in our favor in this unexpected turn. It was Christ that was not conquered by death. Instead, he was the one that conquered death. Conquering death, he rose back to life. So now he cannot die because he has taken over and he has conquered death and he has conquered death for good. It has no more power over him. So why, you may ask, is this good news to us? I mean, Jesus rose from the dead, but how does that translate into our good news? I mean, it does sound good however you look at it, because it's nice to see an enemy who always wins finally get what's coming to him. You know, if you've got a uh, football team, say, in the upstate that always wins a lot, and, and you don't pull for that team, you know, is it good news when they lose, when you didn't beat them? Not really, but it's kind of nice to see sometimes. Finally. And it is good. We see death who has taken everybody down. Finally, somebody has taken him down now. But how does that really translate into good news for us? Well, in one sense, it's, it helps us believe Jesus. It helps us believe every word that he has said to us. Because his resurrection and his ability to conquer death proves that he is the Son of God. 
Only the Son of God could do the things that He did, all the miracles, all the mastery of nature, all the healings, especially that last one. Only the Son of God could pull something like that off. And that means that we can trust His words as true words. We can trust His authority as a true authority. It's not just because Jesus claimed He was the Son of God. Anybody can claim that they're the Son of God. Anyone can go out there and say, I'm the Son of God, or I'm God incarnated. You go to the street, almost every city, somebody out there is yelling that they are God or the Son of God or Jesus come back to the world. Saying it is easy. But if you go out there and say that you're the Son of God, one of three things are true. Either you're a liar, a lunatic, or a Lord. That's it. You're either liar, lunatic, and a Lord. But the reason why we believe that Jesus is the Lord is because He could back up His claim. He rose from the dead. So He's neither liar nor lunatic. But He's the Lord. We can believe His claim and we don't believe the others because Jesus rose from the dead. The only thing the guy on the street can raise is His voice. And that's why we can believe in Jesus, while we can trust in him, his words carry authority now. His teaching is true. And this is where the news gets really good for you and me. Because we can trust Christ's authority. Because we can believe what he said, we can believe the promises that he made to us. We can believe the promises that He made to you and to me and to all that would be His disciples and all that would believe in Him. And the promises He made are many and they are bold promises. One of the promises He made is that in His Father's house there are many mansions, many places. And He's going to come, He's going to take us to be with Him. So that where He is, we may be also. Jesus has promised us that because He lives, we also live. We'll live. Jesus has promised us that if we acknowledge Him as Lord before other human beings, He will acknowledge us before God and all the angels. That if you say you belong to Christ and you publicly declare it, when we die and we face God, Jesus will claim you as one of His own and say, This person belongs to me. That's His promise. The promise of Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and anyone who believes in me, though he dies, yet he shall live. The promise of Jesus tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that any who would believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. These are promises we can believe in. Because we can believe in Jesus Christ. These are promises that we can trust because we can trust in the person of Jesus. And we can believe in this good news that Christ gives us. Jesus Christ has conquered sin and death. And this victory He will give to all who believe and trust in Him. Jesus Christ conquered sin and death and this victory he will give to all who believe and trust in him this is a victory we can't do this is a victory that you and i we cannot pull this off this is a victory that is stronger than than any of us is stronger than than peter thiel and stronger than elon musk and stronger than jeff bezos certainly stronger than me I can't even conquer bad knees, much less conquer death. And this victory is the gift of Jesus Christ to all who believe. An unearned gift. We call it grace. We talk about it a lot. We're big fans of grace around here. You hang around and you'll hear more about it. So does this mean that we are immortal? Does this mean that we have finally achieved that human dream of immortality? Technically, no. Okay, we will live forever with Christ, but we are not immortal. 
Now, it might sound like I'm splitting hairs a little bit, but let me tell you what I mean. Immortal means that you're never going to die. We will die just as Christ did. What we are promised is that you will conquer death also. In John eleven twenty five, 25, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection of the life, he said, I am the resurrection of the life. And anyone who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. He doesn't say you'll, you'll never have to taste of that. You'll never have to go through that. He says, though he dies, even though you will die, yet you will live again. We will face the same death that Jesus did. That is still the human condition. But because he conquered death, he also has the authority to conquer it for every single one of us. And the good news he has promised is because I live, you also shall live. Now I know it's not the kind of immortality that we have always sought after. It's not that kind of immortality human beings have longed to experience. We want to never die, or at least we want to never go through the pain and the fear of dying. But what Christ promises us is that we must die if we're going to experience eternal life. Again, from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, 24, he says, If a kernel of a grain of wheat stays a grain of wheat, then it does nothing. But if it is put into the ground, then it dies, then it will bear much fruit. And he's talking about just a seed, any seed. Could be grain, could be a flower, could be an acorn for, for an oak tree. If it's just sitting there by itself, it's just a seed and nothing's going to happen to it. But when you put it in the ground and the seed dies, then it becomes greater than it ever was. It's just a seed. It turns into something that you could have never imagined coming from a tiny little seed. Go to an oak tree, you see the foot of an oak tree, you see these tiny little acorns. And you think, how does this tiny little acorn become this giant oak tree that's covering this whole yard with shade? Just a seed has to fall into the ground and die first. Then it can become something amazing. You or I, we are that seed. We are that seed. This, this life, this body that we have is just a seed. The seed of our true selves. And only in laying in the ground and dying can God bring us back to become the men and women and the wonderful, beautiful, even glorious creations that God has planned for each and every one of us. We must face that dreaded enemy. Jesus Christ tells us that death is not something we have to fear anymore. We can look into the abyss because it has lost all of its dread. Reminds me of a story of a father and son riding in a car together. And there's a bee riding in the car with him. It's buzzing around and, and, the, and the son is very afraid because he's allergic to bees. And he knows one sting, one sting and he will die. So, so the father reaches out and, and he grabs a hold of the bee. And he, and he holds it in his hand and then he lets it go. So the bee is still buzzing around the car and the son is, 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 is pale and he's, and he's frightened. And his father asks his son, why are you, why are you afraid? And he says, father, you know one sting and, and it will kill me. And then the father reaches his hand out. And then the palm of his hand is the stinger of the bee. Son, you don't have to be afraid. I have taken the sting upon my own hands. We are in that same situation. Death is in the car with us. It's buzzing around. It's threatening us. It's, it's menacing us. But now it's just like an insect that all it can do is buzz and be angry and make a big noise. Because now we have nothing to fear. Behold the body of Christ, the wounds upon his hand, the wounds upon his head. He stretches it out to you and says, see the wound? See, I have taken the sting of death upon my own body. You need not fear it anymore. 
Behold the risen Christ. He has warred with death. And he has won. Our Lord has conquered death. He's conquered it for me. He's conquered it for you. He's conquered it for all who would believe in his name. So today, we can stare into that abyss and not be afraid. We can stare into that abyss and not be afraid because we can look and you can look all you want to. You will not find your Savior there. You can call out his name, but he will not answer from the abyss. Yell as loud as you want into that deep, dark, seemingly endless abyss and you will not hear him answer back. Instead, you will hear another voice. You'll hear a voice that echoes throughout the all of the whole universe that shakes the foundations of the earth to our core. It shakes the stars in heaven. A voice that cries out, He is not here. He has risen. To God be all the glory, forever and ever. Amen.